During Christmas 2012, 76-year-old Patricia Goodband vanished without a trace. When somebody's reported missing, the first few hours and days is critical. In this case, we didn't have that luxury. Pat's business partner and friend, Chris Simons, said he dropped her off at Milton Keynes train station so that she could visit a friend in the north. The idea that Mum would have undertaken such a journey as this all by herself really didn't make any sense to me at all. The investigators questioned those closest to Pat, but not everything was as it seemed. The people that we thought were helping us were in fact telling us an awful lot of lies. So it was our job to unpick the facts from the fiction. Detectives hunting for clues of Pat's whereabouts hoped to find their answer within her diaries, but it would be another piece of written evidence that would give them their biggest breakthrough. Ultimately, what we discovered that day was a checklist for murder. The police searched high and low in their hunt for missing Patricia and wouldn't stop until they had uncovered the truth. The person that committed this crime thought they had planned and prepared enough to outsmart the police, but they were wrong. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Aylesbury in rural Buckinghamshire is a small town surrounded by pretty villages close to the London commuter belt. It's a safe and popular place to raise a family. Aylesbury is a market town in Buckinghamshire. It's expanded over the years with families moving in, made a new railway station as well because it's not that far from London. It's a nice place. 76-year-old Patricia Goodband had lived in the area all of her life. In 1986, Pat was recently separated and living in her own property in a village called Edgecott. She was working at a builder's merchants. Yeah, we placed an order uh, last week. She was the manager there, so she worked either in the shop that they had or worked out in the builder's yard. Whilst at work, Pat became friendly with a local lorry driver named Christopher Simons. Mum and Chris met when she worked at the Builders Merchants. He used to call in for deliveries and they became friends that way. That same year, Pat decided to start up her own small haulage business and she asked her friend Chris if he would like to work for her. The business involved picking up and distributing aggregate to individuals and small companies. When Mum set the company up with Chris, it worked well because Mum was used to doing the books, keeping things balanced on that side. She'd also take the phone calls for the deliveries and it was Chris then that went out and actually made the deliveries. At this time, Chris was living in a property called Akerman House in a small hamlet called Woodham, which was close to the town of Aylesbury. The house had an office set up, five acres of land and a yard, so it was the perfect place to run the new business from. But Chris suffered from a medical condition which affected his stomach. And in 1987, he decided to sell Ackerman House and move into Aylesbury to be closer to the hospital. Pat bought the house from Chris to allow the business to continue running from Ackerman House. As well as being business partners, I would have said that Mum and Chris were good friends too. Mum really didn't like travelling anywhere on her own. She just went to the areas that she knew. So if mum would come and visit, Chris would always drive her in the car. Chris had told me small things about his life, the fact that he'd been married previously, that his wife had died. He'd also had three children, but they unfortunately had also died. Pat's neighbors assumed that she and Chris were romantically involved. When we first moved into the house next door to Chris and Pat, we always assumed that they were husband and wife. They were always together, they were always out walking the dogs together and gardening together. We didn't see an awful lot of Pat because she was a very private person. She would often do a lot of baking and occasionally a mince pies would come over the fence at Christmas. 
Chris was in fact what you would call the perfect neighbour. He was always there to help us. He would come round and chat with my husband in the workshop. As time evolved, we realised that they were not actually married. Chris would talk about his wife and family in Aylesbury. So we assumed that they were having an affair. When Pat moved to Ackerman House, she started renting out her property at Edgecott. A friend of Chris and Pat's called Bob Taft helped with the upkeep of the house, as well as helping Chris with various odd jobs. Although Pat was busy running the business, she also took on some part-time cleaning work for a local couple who were both doctors. Pat turned up for work at 8.30 in the morning, but she was always here a few minutes early, so she was a creature of habit. She was a very good cleaner. We could trust her totally. She did love the dog a huge amount, and I think it was very important to her that the dog loved her as well. Pat was always cheerful and very chatty, but she kept her private life a fairly closed book. Although she was a private person, Pat liked to share her thoughts in a diary, which she wrote in every day. 5th of October, Friday. It's fine, sunny and warm. I'm working on the garden. In 1997, Pat's daughter, Sam, met her future husband and moved from her home in the south up to North Yorkshire. I don't really think Mum was that happy because it was further away from her and I, I guess she'd always hoped that I would stay more local. Mum and Chris did come up one time to actually visit the house. Chris drove Mum up and then she also came up for my wedding in 2001. I last saw Mum in October 2007 and it seemed after that time something changed and she really didn't want us to visit. I guess I never really pushed to find out why. We did speak on the phone at least normally once every month. The dog's out this morning, usual routine. It was something of a comfort to me to know that Chris could help my mum out and he was around if she ever needed anything doing. In 2008, 72-year-old Pat gave half of Ackerman House to her 59-year-old business partner, Chris, and rewrote in her will to say that if she were to pass away, Chris would inherit the whole of Ackerman House, along with her savings, which amounted to £180,000. I never actually knew that Mum had actually bought Aikman House because she always referred to it as Chris's house and I just understood that she had moved in and that she just ran the business from there and that he still owned it. Hello, Sam speaking. In the summer of 2012, Sam received a call from Chris to say he was concerned that he hadn't seen Pat and thought she might have gone away without telling anyone. Yeah, no, no problem. just wondered, have you seen your mother? No, why? Chris had phoned in the late summer to ask if I'd spoken recently to Mum. He said that he had been trying to get in contact with her, but that she wasn't taking any of his calls. Chris also mentioned that apparently Mum had been away for a few days at Easter. He'd gone up to the house and there was just a post-it note on the kitchen table saying that she would be back in a few days. I thought this was quite odd because I'd never known her travel before and couldn't even imagine where she'd gone. Well, thanks for telling me, Chris. Thank you. He was worried about her, and he asked if I would ring and speak to her. Oh, hi, Mum. You're home. Mum answered the phone straight away. Yes, why shouldn't I be? She seemed quite short on the phone and um, a bit annoyed, really, that I'd phone. Oh, I do wish people would keep out my business. OK, bye. Bye. In October 2012, 62-year-old Chris again became concerned by Pat's behaviour when she arrived home from shopping at the supermarket without her car. Chris had gone back to the house and I think had noticed that the van that my mum normally drove wasn't there. You're back? Yeah. Why? Oh, where's the van? He'd asked how she'd got back from the town and she said that she'd caught the bus back. No, I came back on the bus. Why? Because I went on the bus. No, honestly, Pat, you went in the van, I saw you drive out, and you're here now and the van's... I wouldn't have said that she was the sort of person just to have suddenly forgot that she'd travelled somewhere in a van, then to suddenly get the bus home. 
With Christmas arriving, business at Ackerman House slowed down and there was a two-week break over the holiday period. The last time Pat came to work, she was here from 8.30 to 11.30 as per normal. Pat never went away and didn't see her family, so I'm sure she spent most of the Christmas at home. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. Thank you. Have a lovely Christmas. And you. you. Yes, well. And we look forward to seeing you on the third. Yes, January. right. Okay. With work quietening down, Chris attended to other business matters. His friend Bob Taft had recently become redundant, so Chris was keen to help him out by giving him some odd jobs to do. Bob? Yeah, Chris here. How you doing, mate? You couldn't do me a favour, could you? Yeah, I've got to go into Milton Keynes Saturday morning. I could do with a lift. Come on in. When Saturday came around, Pat was late that morning dropping off Christmas presents at Friends, as she did every year. Chris went along too. You need to get a bit worried. I mean, it's not like you at all. Mum was generally the sort of person to put others before herself, but certainly towards the end of 2012, when we were talking, she seemed to be putting a, more of a focus on herself. Well, as I say, 2013 is going to be my year. I'm going to look after me. I'm going to start going out more, doing things for me. Little did her friends know, it was the last time they would see Patricia. We'll see you in the new year. Seventy-six-year-old Patricia Goodband lived at Ackerman House near the town of Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. From her home, she ran a small haulage firm with her 62-year-old business partner, Christopher Simons. A few days before Christmas Day in 2012, Pat and Chris had visited some friends so Pat could hand over presents. We'll see you in the new year. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Mum didn't particularly celebrate Christmas. So we planned to talk again just into the new year. On the 3rd of January 2013, Pat was expected back at her cleaning job, but for the first time ever, she failed to show up for work. Between us, we thought there might have been some misunderstanding, and even that she might have forgotten, but that would have been extremely unlikely for Pat. Chris phoned on Thursday the 3rd of January and told me that he had dropped Mum off at Milton Keynes railway station and that she was coming north. Well, no, no, I didn't see that on the train. Because there was no parking, so I just dropped off outside, but... Um... She sent me a text saying she'd arrived. I thought this was slightly odd because I couldn't ever recall Mum taking a train journey and certainly not a train journey on her own. She would have told me if she was coming up north. Well, when I dropped her off, she said uh, she was coming back today, I think, uh, unless I've got the day wrong. But it took me back to the phone call when I'd spoken to Mum and she'd said about putting herself first and doing more things for herself. And I just wondered if, if this was actually one of those things. Well, should we give it till tomorrow? And if she's not back, can you let me know? Yeah, that's a good idea, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there's no need to worry. After I've spoken to Chris, we agreed that perhaps that we would leave it to the weekend and that if she was journeying back, it may be that she'd planned to stay on a bit longer. When she didn't turn up for work on the Thursday, we contemplated ringing her initially on that day, but I think it would have been very embarrassing for her should she have forgotten. We decided to leave it one day before we rang her. Where you are, I hope you're okay. We actually were so concerned we went round to one of the neighbours who we saw in the front of his property and asked where Pat might have gone. We're looking for Pat. She'll have gone away with Chris. Well, this was news to us because she'd never in her time with us mentioned a gentleman called Chris. It had now been 15 days since 76-year-old Pat had last been seen, and despite her friend and business partner Chris saying that he had expected her to arrive back home on the 3rd of January 2013, there was no sign of her. When speaking with Chris, he did advise me that he felt that if Mum didn't turn up, that I would have to report her as a missing person, and I would have to do that as next of kin. On Monday the 7th, and with Mum still not arriving back, I phoned the local police. They actually advised me that it could be anybody who could report a missing person. So you've still not heard anything from her? Still not heard anything, no. Right, OK. 
The police met with Chris at Ackerman House so he could fill out a missing persons report. Chris told us that he'd last seen Pat on the 22nd of December when him and Bob dropped her at Milton Keynes railway station. He was able to describe her clothing. He was able to tell us about a suitcase that he said she had with her, which was on wheels. And she was carrying um, an envelope with uh, train tickets and, uh, well, quite a bit of cash, about a grand in cash. Chris also showed the police officers a text message on his mobile phone from Pat saying that she'd arrived safely in Stockton and thanking him and Bob for the lift. Chris also produced a Christmas card. Inside, this card was written by somebody called Sue and it said that she was looking forward to seeing Pat over Christmas. He said he only knew that she was a friend of Pat's because he'd overheard them having a telephone conversation. Because Chris had said he wasn't the only person to see Pat on that day, officers visited Bob Taft at his home to take a written statement. He gave us a very detailed account of that last trip to Milton Keynes train station with Pat. He could remember the exact route they'd taken and he could clearly remember what Pat was wearing. Very smart. Not like she'd wear it at a yard. No, no. From all the detailed information that we'd been given, from Chris and from Bob, we became more comfortable that actually Pat had probably gone away for Christmas, had gone up north and was just late coming back. It had been 18 days since Pat had taken her journey and the police were concerned that the CCTV footage may have been deleted. We checked all the cameras on the Milton Keynes train station, which luckily hadn't been recorded over, and there was no trace of Pat anywhere on any of them, so we were starting to get very worried. I sent officers back to Wakeman House to have a good look around. Whilst they were there, they seized a number of items including the Christmas card. And there were certainly no signs within that house that anything sinister had happened to Pat. Detectives had very little to go on and were no closer to discovering the whereabouts of Pat. But later that day, events took an interesting turn and Thames Valley Police were given their first major breakthrough. We received a phone call from Bob Taff telling us that he wanted to speak to us about the statement he'd made and that he felt he hadn't told us the whole truth. Good afternoon, Mr Taff. Would you come with me down to the station, please, sir? Bob was interviewed under caution, and despite telling us previously that he had dropped Pat at the railway station, he now admitted that this was false. In fact, he hadn't seen Pat at all that day. Do me a favour, will you, Bob? Yeah, what's that? If anyone asks, yeah. just say we dropped Pat off at the station today, will you? Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, sure. Bob said that he and Chris had driven past the train station at Milton Keynes on their way to collect a lorry, but Pat had never been in the car with them. Bob then went on to tell us some more alarming news about some strange things that had happened over the last few days. Chris had offered him a cash loan of £10,000. I've got some money. I'd like to lend it to you, help you get back on your feet. But more alarmingly, Bob told us that Chris had asked him to look after some ammunition for him. It's just some ammunition I had left over. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, oh, go on, just for me, for a favour. There you are. Yeah, yeah OK, I suppose okay, so. Good, yeah. good, good. Bob refused the offer of the loan, but he did look after the ammunition for Chris and took it home with him. It was now vital that the police spoke to Chris Simons. We invited him in to sign his statement. As soon as he arrived, both he and Bob were arrested for murdering Patricia and for concealing her body. I honestly thought that the police had lost the plot, really, because it had been Chris who had been assisting me over the past week with all the details about my mum. Yeah, bye. Yet here they were telling me that it was Chris that they'd arrested. Our primary concern now was to find out what had happened to Pat, and if it was something sinister, if she had been murdered, where was her body? We now had three potential crime scenes. Pat's house, Bob's house, and Chris's house. After Chris's house had been forensically searched, colleagues and I went in to do a more thorough search to see what we could find. I found £10,000 in cash, and I also found a box of Christmas cards. The box of Christmas cards was very interesting because when we looked, we could see that the designs on the cards matched exactly the Christmas card that Chris had presented at Aikman House, saying it was from Sue in Stockton. 
What was interesting was when we looked at this box of Christmas cards, it was supposed to be a box of 10 cards, but one card was missing. In interview, we told Chris that we had found a box of Christmas cards in his loft that matched the one found at Aikman House. Can you just explain to me then why it is that you've got a box of 10, or technically a box of nine, and Christmas cards of the same design of a Christmas card that Patricia has I, I from can't, Sue? I, I can't explain it, no. I didn't even know they were there. And that was he denied writing the Christmas card, but was prepared to give us a handwriting sample. A sticking point for us were two text messages that Chris said he'd received on his mobile phone from Pat. The first one had been on the 18th of December, saying that she had bought train tickets. And the second one was on the 22nd of December, where she said she had arrived in Stockton safely and to thank Bob for the lift. This was significant to us, but until we had analysed the cell site data, we weren't able to tell when those messages were sent, where those messages were sent from, and more importantly, who had sent those messages. At this point in their investigation, Thames Valley Police had one person in custody saying they had dropped Pat off at Milton Keynes train station and one person who said they hadn't. But having trawled through CCTV footage for the 22nd of December 2012, there was no trace of Pat having been there. We revealed to Chris that his friend Bob Taft had told us that he had lied and that in fact he hadn't taken Pat to Milton Keynes train station on the 22nd of December. Not enough now. Robert Taft has been interviewed. He's admitted to lying to the police and state, although he picked you up, he never picked Patricia up. Yeah. It was just you two. Yeah. You surprised me. By Tuesday the 15th of January, Pat had been missing for 23 days and the inquiry had become a no-body murder investigation. The big issue had with searching Aikman House was the fact it had five acres of land surrounded it. In the early part of that search, uh, one of the dog handlers found an area of land where it was evident there had been recent disturbance in the soil. The area was immediately sealed off with a forensic tent so that the intricate excavation process could begin. A brick shaft had been discovered uh, underneath a, um, a heap of soil. When I first looked at the, the area of the shaft, the excavation had already been begun. Some of the soil over the top of it had been removed, and we worked in relays to hand excavate with a, with a trowel and a bucket um, the soil in 15 centimetre slices. When I began to excavate within the shaft, there was very little staining. Everything appeared that it hadn't been down there, filling that area for any great length of time. Investigators also started visiting Pat's friends and neighbours to establish whether they had noticed anything suspicious leading up to the day Pat was last seen alive. One couple looked back onto the rear of the property. They were able to tell us, firstly, that Pat was a creature of habit and that 9 o'clock at night her bedroom light would go on, but from the 22nd of December, the neighbour had not seen her light on in her bedroom. At around the same time, they had seen Chris in his digger driving up and down the garden and the paddock. They thought this was odd because the ground was very wet and marshy and they knew Pat was very particular about her garden and she would not have appreciated Chris churning up the land with his digger. But it was when the police spoke to another set of Pat's friends that Chris's story really began to unravel. When was the last time that you, you saw her? The 22nd, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Yes. The friend said that they were a little bit concerned about Pat on that particular day. She seemed very quiet. Chris was in a bit of a hurry to go, I think. OK. And they felt also that she was upset. They actually asked her what was concerning her, and she explained that she had financial problems. This appeared to be the last occasion that anyone other than Chris saw Pat alive. The painfully slow process of digging out the drainage shaft at Ackerman House continued throughout the week. We'd been working on the site for about five days when the weather began to close in. Conditions became absolutely appalling and we had to call off the search. I was pretty concerned at this stage. We were no further forward. We hadn't 
found Pat, and I was wondering where we were going to be going next. What Chris and his team didn't realise was just how close they were to their biggest breakthrough of all. In January 2013, Thames Valley Police were investigating the disappearance of 76-year-old Patricia Goodband, who had not been seen since the 22nd of December 2012. Detective Superintendent Chris Ward had two people in custody in connection with Pat's disappearance and possible murder. Pat's friend and business partner Chris Simons claimed to have dropped Pat off at Milton Keynes train station with his friend Bob Taft on December the 22nd so she could visit a friend named Sue in the north. But Bob Taft had admitted to police that he had lied in his initial statement and said that he hadn't seen Pat that day and they had not dropped her off at the train station. 30 days after Pat was last seen alive, digging continued in the land around her house. I received a call from the search team to say that they had found something very significant at the excavation area. At this stage, we'd already lifted probably upwards of 30, 35 tonnes of soil. And we were recovering the rubbish bags that had become the, the latest layer that we'd come across. And it was within that layer of bags that we came across the remains of a body in a, in a seated position up against the, um, the brick wall of the shaft. When I received this news, that there was really mixed emotions. On the one hand, I was very relieved that we'd find Pat, but of course, on the, the other hand, I'd always hoped in the back of my mind that we would find Patricia alive. When the police did confirm that the body that they had found was Mum's, it was still at that point that I just still really couldn't take it in. I could hear what I was being told, but it just still didn't seem real. And I guess I really still hope that they, they had got it wrong. Once Pat's body had been removed from the well, a pathologist was able to carry out a post-mortem. He concluded that Pat had received a number of blows to the head with a heavy instrument. We don't know where Pat was killed. We assume that she was lured out to the garden near to the drainage pit as she had her wellies on. Pat was likely to be facing away from her attacker. There was a significant injury to the back of her head, which he believes was caused by a blunt weapon or instrument of some sort. What was also clear from his examination was that it would appear that Pat has then turned round to face her attacker as there was a significant defence wound on her left arm. She was then thrown down the drainage shaft and covered with soil and rubbish. Looking at some of the evidence they had already gathered, Thames Valley Police felt sure that Chris had planned to murder Pat, the Christmas card he'd shown police, and the text messages which he claimed were sent by Pat herself. Police began searching through the computer data which had been seized from Ackerman House, along with Chris's mobile phone and diaries of Pat's found at the property. As part of our investigation, we searched through the computer at Aikman House and we discovered that on the 18th of December, there had been some searches on train times from Milton Keynes to Stockton. We established from the people that Pat cleaned for that at 10.45 a.m. on the 18th of December, the time that that search was made for those tickets, they confirmed that Pat was at work for them. So she couldn't have been in Aikerman House and she couldn't have made the search on that computer. The police also continued to interview Pat's friends and family. What was clear was there was a great amount of uncertainty about the relationship which Pat and Chris had with each other. Pat was quite secretive about her home life, but she told us what she wanted us to know only, which is fair enough, and her private life was private. I know it used to annoy my mum when people intimated that the relationship was more than just a business one and she would say, really, they were just like brother and sister. Detectives looked through Pat's diaries for clues about their relationship. Reading through Pat's diaries, she would often mention Chris, who she referred to as CJ. Washing, CJ to the dentist. The diaries were very detailed. They gave us a very clear picture of how Pat was feeling. What was very frustrating and very concerning, of course, was that there were two diaries that were missing, and that was the 2011 diary 
and the 2012 diary, and I believe that they would have told us a lot more about the build-up to this chain of events. I believe that those diaries were destroyed by Chris Simons to cover up the state of their relationship and, in fact, what drove him to murder her. From our police records, we realised that there had been a previous incident between Chris and Pat back in December 2007, on Christmas Day, when the police had been called to Aikman House by Chris. Can you send someone up to Aikman House, please? Yep. Well, we, we've had a fracas over Christmas and uh, I've assaulted my partner. No, it's Simon, right. Simon, look, leave this to me. Look, I want to go away for this. Leave this to me, OK? When we had investigated yeah. that, police officers had gone out to see what had gone on. Pat denied that anything had happened and that it was just an argument. However, when we went through her diaries and read the entry for Christmas Day in 2007, it told a very different story. The second bash. I will not wait for the third. From the entries, Pat talks about an argument over a long-standing agreement. No, Pat, Christmas, and no, no, I don't care. I've just had enough. You've got on and on. I believe that long-standing agreement was that Chris Simons would leave his wife and he would move in with Patricia and he would give her the company and the companionship that she so longed for. Despite Chris denying in an interview he'd ever been violent towards Pat, this proved that there had been some form of domestic violence between them in the past. The call actually states when you called the police that you hit her. I didn't actually hit her. No. Okay. I and mean, we've got the log. Yeah. Um, the caller's just assaulted his partner. I sometimes think now, with hindsight, that that's the time that things probably changed between us. That was the time when she said about us not going down to visit anymore. Investigators carried out cell site analysis on Chris's mobile phone to see if they could find anything that would tell them more about the time leading up to Pat's disappearance. From examining Chris Simon's mobile phone records, we started to build up a picture of a man who was in a number of different relationships with a number of different women. Chris had previously told Pat's daughter, Sam, that his wife and three children had all died. In fact, Chris and his wife of 30 years lived in Aylesbury and they had three grown-up sons. Detectives also discovered that despite Chris being married and spending vast amounts of time with Pat at Ackerman House, he was simultaneously having affairs with three other women, claims Chris denied when interviewed. Were you in a relationship with another woman? No. I've got other women friends, yeah. I've OK. Got other men friends. Who you flirt with? Yeah, probably flirt, yeah. Chris was having sexual relationships with these three other women. He was texting them, ringing them repeatedly, and it must have been very complicated trying to keep all these different lives separate. Chris Simons had a specific medical condition which affects his digestive system. He had told his family that he had to go to a clinic every night for an injection. It was very clear from the work that we did that there was no such clinic and there were no such injections, and I believed he was using that as an excuse to leave the family house so he could go and carry on his affairs with the different women that we'd identified. As part of our inquiries, we contacted all three women and spoke to them, but one of the women stood out in particular as there was most contact between her and Chris, and she lived locally. We contacted this woman, Jennifer Creasy, and she did confirm that she did know Chris and that she had actually been in a relationship with him on and off for the last 30 years. Detectives were sure that the Christmas card sent to Pat from a friend named Sue had been faked, and they approached everyone connected with Chris Simons for a handwriting sample. If it's that Christmas card you're talking about, I wrote it. This was an important breakthrough for the police, but it was essential they pinpointed when the card was written to determine firstly if Chris had indeed pre-planned Pat's murder, and secondly, whether this woman was also involved in the crime. Jennifer was brought to the station and interviewed, and in her interview, she said that Chris had bought her the Christmas card two or three weeks before Christmas, and that's when she'd written it. He just gave it to me and opened it up and told me what to write. Chris had bought her the Christmas card and dictated the words to her. She'd happily written it and didn't ask any questions about it. I didn't know Sue, I didn't know where Stockton was, and I didn't know Sam. Okay. Chris's son told us that his father had asked him, sometime after Christmas, 
to get a Christmas card for him because he wanted to send money to charity. He remembered that this had happened after Christmas because he'd already placed all the Christmas items back into the loft. What we think may have happened is that Chris has heard Dr Whittington's message on the answer machine and has then gone to see Jennifer on the 6th and got her to sign the Christmas card. He thought this card would be enough to convince people that Pat had actually gone away for Christmas. Jennifer Creasy was arrested at her home on suspicion of assisting an offender, perverting the course of justice and for conspiracy to murder Pat. There was another piece of evidence that Thames Valley Police could glean from their work on Chris's mobile phones, which made them even more certain of his guilt. We conducted cell site analysis of the phone that he was telling us that Pat was using for the 18th of December, saying that uh, she had purchased rail tickets on the 22nd of December, when he says he received a text from Pat's phone saying she was in Stockton. It showed that both those phones were using the same mast, and that mast covers Ackerman House. So therefore, what's very clear is that those two phones were together when those messages were sent. Thames Valley Police were more confident than ever that they had the right suspects in custody, but what they didn't have at this stage was a motive for the crime. We spoke to the two other women who Chris was involved with, apart from Jennifer, and one of them told us that, in fact, Chris had told her he was buying a house in the exclusive Sandbanks development in Dorset and had asked her whether she wanted to move in with him. This woman thought that Chris was either very rich or was about to come into a lot of money. The police did more investigation into Chris and Pat's finances. What we know about their finances was that, firstly, Chris had owned Ackerman House originally, and it would appear that he'd sold it to Pat in 1986. During the period between 2007 and 2008, Pat made a will which effectively meant that, on her death, Chris would be entitled to Ackerman House. So as it stood, if Pat passed away, Chris was entitled to Aikman House, which is worth about £600,000, and Pat Savings, which are worth up to £200,000. In the months leading up to Christmas 2012, Pat had made inquiries with estate agents locally looking for a house to buy in the Aylesbury area, and she said she had £180,000 to spend. That's these two, yeah, these are just, just new on the market, actually, yeah. When the estate agents asked if they could contact Pat by phone or email, she was adamant they could only contact her through the post. Anything new we can, we can post out mm. to you, that's no problem. This made me think that she wanted to keep it a secret that she was looking for properties and she didn't want anyone else at home to find out. Vast amounts of circumstantial evidence had now been gathered by Thames Valley Police, but they were about to stumble upon one more piece of the puzzle which would convince them that Chris Simons was guilty of Patricia's murder. What we discovered that day was a checklist for murder. Much to the shock and horror of those that knew him, Thames Valley Police had charged 63-year-old Christopher Simons with the murder of his 76-year-old friend and business partner, Patricia Goodband. We couldn't believe that Chris, who was such a good neighbour, so friendly and helpful, could ever be capable of such a dreadful crime. And despite Chris denying any involvement in the disappearance and murder of Pat, the police came across a unique piece of evidence that would not only convince them of his guilt, but also confirm the crime was premeditated. When I went through the bag of property that had been seized from Chris's pickup, I found a scrap of paper, and on that scrap of paper was a handwritten note entitled The Twelve Days of Christmas. From that, it looked to me as if these were pre-planned notes written down describing Pat's disappearance. There were a number of dates on there that were circled which were very significant to the investigation. I relate these numbers to the date that Pat was away and the fact that the third is ringed shows that that was the day she was due back at work and when people would start to get worried that she wasn't around. He told us she'd been dropped at Milton Keynes on the 22nd to Milton Keynes, Saturday AM, me and B and P. He says that she sent a text message saying she was in Stockton and he'd actually written the contents of those texts underneath. By 1pm, train text, OK. She is in Stockton. 
Laurie back home. That really was the final piece in the jigsaw that he had planned uh, this. It was very premeditated and that was designed to remind him about the story that he needed to give to the police. So when Patricia texted you just the first one to say she got the tickets, did you respond to her? I don't think I did. It might probably be my phone if I did, but... OK. Did you respond to her and say thanks to Bob for the lift? I don't think I did that either. Christmas time gave Chris the opportunity to carry out his plans in murdering Pat. The business was going to be closed down for two weeks. The neighbours around would often go away and Pat was not a great lover of Christmas. She would often have no contact with friends or family during that period. He believed that he had a two week head start to make sure he'd done everything properly. But he made a, a number of significant mistakes. The court case began on the 30th of September 2013 at Reading Crown Court. 63-year-old Christopher Simons was on trial for the murder of Patricia Goodband, a charge which he denied. 73-year-old Jennifer Creasy faced one charge of perverting the course of justice and one evading an offender, both of which she denied. 59-year-old Robert Taft admitted to charges of perverting the course of justice and possession of ammunition without a licence. He was not required to attend the trial. As a court case progressed, it was clear that Chris's lies that had been telling were beginning to unravel before him, and we were beginning to see the real Chris. One of the stories that he told us about his first wife and children dying was all a lie. He hadn't been married before, and he hadn't had these three children who'd all tragically died. No, that's not true. Chris told a number of people, including the police, that he thought Pat was suffering from dementia. He told us that she was forgetful. I've been a general practitioner for over 30 years. When I was giving evidence in court, the defence barrister was trying to make Pat out as though she was suffering from signs of dementia which was clearly untrue, because Pat was a very clued up, on the ball lady. I guess this made us see a different Chris to the one that we thought we knew, and that he was obviously capable of, of telling these lies. But the biggest lie of all was still to come. It was a surprise when we got to court and, and, and we found out that he was changing his defence. I'd arranged with Pat on her request that if anyone asked her whereabouts between Christmas and New Year, then that is what I had to say. Chris's defence now at court was that, in fact, Pat had decided she was going to go away at Christmas and he was going to help cover for her. This line of defence seemed quite ridiculous when you consider that even when Pat's body was found and Chris was charged with murder and he'd spent months in custody, that he was still sticking by the story that Pat was going away for Christmas and he was covering for her. And why didn't you tell the police the truth? It's what she'd asked me to agree to do, and I did it. How that really answered how my mum came to have been murdered, I, I just couldn't see. It still didn't give us the answer of how my mum ended up dead. On the 25th of October 2013, the court case came to an end. Robert Taft, who had earlier pleaded guilty to his charges, was sentenced to 10 months in prison for perverting the course of justice and 14 days in prison for being in possession of ammunition without a licence. Jennifer Creasy was found guilty of one count of perverting the course of justice, but not guilty of aiding an offender. She was sentenced to six months in prison. After just four and a half hours of deliberation, Chris Simons was found guilty of murdering Patricia Goodband. On the 28th of October, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a 27-year tariff. It was just a tremendous relief to know that these 12 people had hopefully either seen through or not believed his lies. When Chris was found guilty of the murder of Patricia, there was this overwhelming feeling of satisfaction and relief. But really, you know, these things are, they're nothing to celebrate. He made himself out to be a victim to everybody, would tell people about his 
dead wife, his dead children, and all these women would feel sorry for him and seem to love him unconditionally for over 30 years, and it was all lies. I think the motive for the murder was purely for greed, purely to inherit Pat's money, and he had spun a web of lies and deceit in order to put off the investigating officers. But at the end of the day, he was unsuccessful. It's ruined, you know, our family in terms of that I've lost my mother and the boys have lost their grandmother. And um, that's hard. That, 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 that's hard to think about. Ironically, Chris destroyed the diaries that would have told us exactly what had happened, so he destroyed her written word. Yet it was the words that he'd written and the words we found in his vehicle that ultimately convicted him of her murder.